My name is Joe Slowick. I'll be talking today about outflanking the adversary, or I also like to refer to this as being active defense. So a little roadmap for where we're going to go today. So first we're going to talk about who I am, why you should listen to me, or why you take anything that I say with, you know, remotely a grain of salt. Uh, sort of what the current defensive mindset is, where we go from here, and then, you know, how do we actually implement that? And finally, I'll illustrate that with a couple of what I find are pretty interesting case studies from my own operations at Los Alamos National Lab. So, who am I? So currently, I run the incident response team at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, I manage incidents, direct hunting, and just threat intelligence, and do other things. For those not familiar, Los Alamos is part of the Department of Energy, more specifically, the National Nuclear Security Administration, so in charge of the things that go very, very big booms. Uh, prior to that, though, I'm very much a non-traditional background. So I'm not a computer science student. I was a philosophy student and a grad school washout. Um, however, I enjoyed doing data mining, formal logic, and other things, which helped me a lot because in addition to that and liking puzzles, I was able to go back and start fleshing out my IT background. And then I joined the Navy. So I was an information warfare officer from 2009 to 2014, worked at NSA Washington, did counterterrorism work from 2010 to 2013, and otherwise providing sing it, eh, signals intelligence indicators and warnings to platforms afloat and deployed overseas. Uh, also what I like to refer to as useful threat intelligence, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. So why does any of this matter? Well, you know, other than puffing myself up in front of you to make me seem like I might be important, uh, it should go to emphasize that I hate sitting still. So I like to have control over things, have some guidance over my destiny. And so in moving from the Navy to a more traditional cybersecurity environment, I found that the SOC IR mindset is just incredibly passive. And it's so much better to pursue your adversary than to wait for them to do something bad to you. So one of the things that I had to encounter when moving into my current role is how do I apply me to the network defense enterprise? So first, let's go over what security today means, or at least security as I think it's actually implemented. So white papers and best practice documents, they may say one thing, but what does security really look like in practice when you, you know, peek underneath the covers and see what's actually going on? Well, among other things, we still have lots of static defenses. So you have lots of tools and whatever things that are sitting out there with a the signature set, and if you know, it gets caught up, that's great. If it's something that goes around it, you're kind of screwed. We rely a lot on technical controls. So if the IPS is working and has a signature for something, that's awesome. And if not, again, you're kind of screwed. And if you can fuzz it, you're also screwed. And lastly, quote, emphasizing the you're kind of screwed, we ignore the unexpected. So if something's, you know, whether it's a technique that we haven't seen before, a different variety of an attack pattern that we may have had a signature set for previously, but has been fuzzed somehow, we, we don't see it or we can't react to it in time until after we see some subsequent signs of compromise. So the state of the present is that an analyst, generously speaking, uh, monitors the SIM. So I'm not picking on a vendor here, but if you know ArcSight, that's ArcSight. Uh, you wait for an alert, close the alert or declare an incident, lather, rinse, repeat, move on. So that's one way of doing business. You can certainly keep up with the tickets or the events or the incidents or however you want to call it. But I find that this puts us at a very great disadvantage when it comes to truly implementing defense. So the presence fails because the security team's always in reactive mode. You've ceded that initiative to the adversary. The choice of battleground, if you want to go one way uh, in looking towards it, or at least how you're going to fight this battle against whoever's trying to break into your network. And not only that, it's really kind of boring. So it's a non-trivial item because if you want to try and keep people or make people interested in doing defense, because every time you talk to someone who's getting out of school, like, I want to be a pen tester. It's like, well, that's, you know, all cool and good and whatnot, but there's really something to be said for the, the defensive mindset too. And I think that the way that we presented it though has made others get turned off to the idea that being an incident response is just isn't as sexy as being one of those red teamers. That constant wait and see approach just builds disinterest, dissent, and causes people to check out and look for sexier things. So instead of waiting, let's focus on finding. An event may have already occurred, but at least we're not waiting for an alarm to fire. We're going out and finding it ourselves instead of waiting, sitting on our asses for something to pop up in front of us to respond to. So we're taking the fight to the adversary, making the adversary, if we're doing this right, feel uncertain and uncomfortable in their own TTPs. We're building confidence on our own security teams that they are on the same footing as the people who are trying to break into the network and that they can engage them on their own terms. And not only that, like I said before, we're making defense sexy again. Not great again, sexy again, there's a difference. So we want to hunt for evil, but how do we do that? So here's a couple of fun images that I thought that both reflect on my background and kind of get towards you know, where I think we should be going here. So first, an active patrolling defensive mindset. So security teams should always be looking for bad instead of just waiting for things to pop up to respond to. That means aggressively seeking intrusion. Colloquially, you'll see this defined as hunting. 
But not only that, for hunting to be effective, you have to know your adversary, know what they're doing, know how they're trying to live off the land or what they're doing in order to break in. So for this mindset, I look to the find, fix, finish, exploit, and analyze my, uh, model, which we'll get to in a little bit uh, towards network defense. And you could refer to this as threat intelligence, but useful. So hunting is a lot more than you think. So everyone likes to talk about like, oh yes, my security team does hunting. We have a team of hunters, we go out. But it's more than just looking for bad things. You can have a bunch of analysts who are going out there. It's like, oh, I want to go down the you know, sc.exe route today, or I want to look for anomalous network traffic. Well, OK, that's good. But the key to doing this in a sustainable enterprise format is that you need something that's repeatable, documentable, and instrumented. So hunting is not just something you do. It's a process that needs to be managed. So you need to track efforts, you need to share results, and not only that, you have to ensure that the entire attack chain is covered. <sighs> I know, some of you may have seen this already, so this is the Mandiant model, there's a couple of other models that are out there, but there's an important concept that you can take away from here. So this is an abstraction, so I start, you know, initial recon, all the way through the exploit chain to completing the mission, whatever that mission may be. But the important part about referring to an attack chain, whatever model you want to look at, is that when you're looking at what it is that your analysts are hunting for, is everyone focusing on those initial compromises? Do you have a bunch of people who are really comfortable working on the network stack or finding those uh, you know, server-side exploits? In which case, you've just ceded all of this terrain to the people who are trying to break in. So if you're not tracking what people are looking at and covering this entire chain or whatever model that, oops, that you're going with, you're leaving yourself wide open to a variety of other attacks that you otherwise aren't uh, instrumenting yourself to defend against. So in order to apply hunting as a process, and this is a screenshot of my own console and how I keep track of how my analysts are doing things, this is a little dated, but you get the idea, is some macro level tracking. So in this case, like, okay, just give me a heat map of, you know, what are we looking at? What parts of the attack chain are we targeting and how we're going out and looking for things? And focus on each stage to make sure that, okay, something evaded a network defense. Well, are we instrumented on host to see it when it fires? If we miss it there, are we seeing it when it tries to beacon out to a C2 domain? If we miss it there, are we at least catching exfiltration or subsequent command and control? So we want to make sure that all the steps are covered and that we monitor this on a day-to-day -day basis, monitoring hunting as it happens, to make sure that everyone's looking at a different piece of the stack and that nothing is left um, uncovered. So now going into threat intelligence, I re referenced this earlier. So this is a model that was implemented initially by Admiral McRaven's misguided children in different operations than cyber. But you know, first you want to find out what it is you're looking for. Look at this as intelligence or the after actions from something that happened. I want to fix it in time and space. Where is it? How do I find it? Where do I go and kill it? Finish it. So take care of the incident in this case, the intrusion, make sure it's stopped. But you don't stop there. Next, exploit the information that you got from that event. So what did I learn? What information did I gather from this? And more importantly, how do I pivot from that so that I can analyze this, not just within the scope of the event that happened, but also within the corpus of events that may happen? How does this event that happened, whether it's a threat intelligence article that I ingested or an actual event that took place in my network, how do I abstract from that to apply to all future possible events to make sure that I have maximal coverage on just what is possible within the scope of the systems in question? So here's another image that some of you may be familiar with and that probably comes up at least, I think this is the first in this conference. So I've got the first two uh, pyramid of pain. But uh, you know, in looking at this again, it's artificial construct, but at the same time there's some use to be said for it in that you know, when you start living down here, you know, domain names, IP addresses, hash values, it's typically what you see in a threat intelligence report. It's typically what you see in after action incident reporting. It's almost useless information. Yeah, it's really good in the moment, like if you're trying to block an active C2 channel or you have a known piece of malware that's actively at work within your network, but you know, whether it's the ransomware guys to the latest APT, Fozzie Bear, whatever that's out there, these guys are adaptable and will change stuff. So this stuff will go away. However, if you understand the why behind them, you start getting into TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, those ways that the adversary fundamentally operates versus the reflection of what that operational mindset is on their part. So you want to go away from indicators, which that's technical stuff, that's for machines, that's automated, get your analyst away from that mindset and occupy that conceptual strategic terrain where how the adversary thinks, how they operate, how they want to work within the network. So in ingesting information, whether it be from threat intelligence, after action incident, circle of trust, what have you, 
what sort of things are you looking for? We want to combine different facets of what you're seeing. So there's the technical respect aspects, so malware analysis and reverse engineering, network forensics activity, host forensics, what are the sort of things that I see on machine that I need to fit into sensors or that my analysts can go out and look for, Tradecraft, which is something that often gets left by the wayside. So how does the actor operate? You know, do they live off the land in terms of they go up for the latest and greatest WordPress exploit, take over a bunch of domains and use that for C2, or do they happen to have a very nice um, habit in how they register lookalike domains that I can track via other means? Um, do they, you know, reuse the same pieces of malware? Do they have, you know, a, a various different ways of looking at how the adversary does their business? And finally, any information that you have, if it's caught within a vacuum, it's not terribly useful. Because I like to think about this, that we're all in this together, whether that's your own enterprise network, other people within your industry field, whatever, and all of us, you know, well, those of us who are here, in the defender mindset, that if you're not sharing this, you're not making sure that that adversary loses their ability to operate. We're not taking that fight to them. Rather, we're you know, setting one little enclave off in a more secure state and leaving everyone else worse off as a result. So how do you get from intelligence to action? Well, first, get an idea for what general TTPs are out there. So continue monitoring those generic ways of operating on machine. And we mentioned this earlier in a different talk, but computers are designed to operate in a semi-predictable fashion that given no, you know, a certain set of input, you should expect a certain set of output. As a result, attackers only have so many ways without getting into the zero day and other sorts of goofiness or, or whatnot. That's DEF CON coming up later this year. Um, you know, there's only so many things to really look for to make sure that your bases are covered across all those fundamental ways of operating on system. Identify a means to track them and also to cl uh, classify general intrusion characteristics. From there, you can move into more targeted things. And when I say targeted, you know, APT is kind of a nice little, you know, everyone more or less knows what I'm talking about with an advanced persistent threat, but, you know, just anything that's focused specifically on your enterprise. So maybe we're talking about a bunch of Romanian, Ukrainian, you know, gangsters or whatever that are trying to commit financial fraud against your enterprise, or in my case, from a nuclear weapons laboratory, I'm talking about nation states that are trying to steal the keys to the kingdom. So who are the people that are trying to come after you? How do they operate? What are their fundamental ways of you know, initial compromise, getting on host, how do they bury in, and how do they try to make sure that they can't go away? Orient your enterprise to those specific threats to make sure that on top of having the general covered so that you've got a good baseline, they are also focused on the threats that are of most interest to you. And lastly, based upon what you've done there, both in covering the general and moving to the specific, what have you missed? So what pathways don't you have coverage for would be one main thing. So if you're not doing host logging, like, well, first off, you're wrong. Second off, are you doing this to the appropriate level that you're catching all of the things that you need? Yeah, you're doing Windows event logging. Cool story. Are you logging PowerShell? Well, if not, you probably should be because everyone likes using PowerShell these days. Similarly, you know, like this is a more controversial topic, but depending on what kind of network you're in, are you breaking SSL? Breaking SSL kind of sucks, but if you look at what a lot of the actors are doing, again, from ransomware up to nation state, everyone likes using regular old SSL, whether it's, a, you know, grab a EFF, um, let's encrypt cert, or, you know, self-sign, whatever. So you need to make sure that if you can't break that, well, how am I oriented in order to make sure I'm catching this up? Otherwise, am I looking at metadata? Am I looking for those certs? Like if you have bro or something along the lines and I can pull cert signatures and match that up against a known database of bad things based upon cert registration. Uh, Census IO is a fun thing to play with when it's up to date. Um, and anyway, just making sure that you're applying this down, down the line. I should just omit this slide. That diagram is completely illegible, my apologies. But this example workflow that if any of you can read, you win a prize. So it starts off with, you know, we have incidents, hunting, and threat intelligence. Move that into a triage mode. Like, what's absolutely important in the moment? What can be, you know, put off until tomorrow, next week, whatever? And pivoting from there, okay, apply your disciplines of incident response methodology. So I look at this as network research, host research, and malware analysis. From there, classify what you've got. So what did I get as a result of looking at, whether it's incident data, a threat intel report, or a tipper from an external party? Do I have something that's specific to the incident? Do I have something that's a general TTP signature that's gonna cover not just this event, but potentially a number of future ones? Or do I have something that's focused on a specific actor? So, having said that, uh, a couple of case studies that illustrate what I'm talking about, and some of the details on this are a little fuzzier than I'd like, but uh, I couldn't get into too much on this. But first, we'll talk about something that happened back on uh, November 9th, day after election day. 
uh, Velexity, and I think they released this on the 10th, actually, uh, put forth a blog posting. I'd never heard of these guys until this came out. Uh, about some APT-related phishing and a review of the information in question, and they call it out right there with Power Duke. So APT29, Cozy Bear, they're in the news with doing shenanigans and whatnot. So okay, really bad guys associated with a really bad place. All right, so let's see what we've got here. So first thing, did anything happen locally? If we receive this and something happened, well, watch the incident response plan and go from there. But if not, we've got insight into an actor of interest that if we didn't see it on our own network, we might see something like this in the very near future or a related enterprise might have seen this. So dig into all available information, gather what other intel we can, and start creating information on our own going beyond what these guys provided, but one, to confirm it, and two, to try and see if we can get a layer or two deeper. So, uh, dividing and conquering, we looked for more information. Velexity was very nice in providing a lot of information on the fish themselves. We were able to pull some samples from Virus Total and do a couple of other uh, snarkier things in order to grab samples of the malware in question. And the malware that we're talking about here is somewhat sophisticated. I mean, you could see there's some anti-analysis stuff that's going on here. This is just a snippet. In this case, it's looking for Process Explorer, Task Manager, or Wireshark. Uh, the way that these guys have operated across some uh, macro-based malware plus PowerShell scripting is do a counter-based tracking of like, hey, if I see this process or if I see this driver to check if you're running in a VM or not, increment this counter. Well, that's very easy to get around when you're debugging it, but if you don't know that that's there, it makes it a pain in the tush. Um, but also, if you look at the PowerShell itself, there's a few things going on that should stick out if you're familiar at all with PowerShell. So I'm sure that there's a really good reason for some developer out there to use io.filestream or io.seek origin for a legitimate purpose. However, I am yet to find it, at least not in my environment. So these are really good tells that someone is leveraging the PowerShell library in order to do something that's really interesting, if not outright bad. So good news, no sign of local infection, so awesome. The better news is that this same PowerShell stuff that I'm talking about, along with some related items, we were already well instrumented against that as a result of work that we had done several months prior against PowerSploit and against some of the ransomware families that were active that were using uh, encoded PowerShell commands and VBA scripts. So as a result of going after this commodity garbage, we were well instrumented in order to catch you know, big bad Russian net hacker, whatever craziness that may have come down the pipe. So, work on general PowerShell maliciousness yields host-based signatures for APT malware. So in our case, we use something called Windows Logging Service. It's uh, developed within the Department of Energy. It's available for license. I prefer it to uh, the sysinternals uh, syslog utility because it captures all those PowerShell commands, but there's various other ways of doing that. Uh, and we track via Splunk, or Splunk Shop. So it's detection, it's not prevention, but if you look at where we're detecting things, we're detecting it far earlier in that attack chain than we would if we'd allowed that to fire off, embed it within the host, and then we didn't see this until we started seeing uh, command and control later on. So a focus on more general TTPs resulted in a signature that would catch a nation state actor. Cool. And you can see a couple of our alerts here that we have set up tracking PowerShell events. So among other things, looking for you know, string encoding, uh, various uh, retrieve URLs, download, upload file, et cetera. And so all sorts of things that can be leveraged within the PowerShell library that we typically see very rarely in legitimate use but are well aligned with lots of different malicious activity we've seen spanning commodity to nation state. So one of the nice things about this is that, okay, we realized that we already were sort of ahead of the game on this one in terms of being able to catch initial infection vectors. So where do we go next? Start ripping into the malware that we're able to find in the second stage. So what we were able to identify uh, as a result was we had a PE file that was in, uh, embedded as an alternate data stream within a PNG. Again, if you see a legitimate use of this ever, I would really love to hear about it because I can't see any case whatsoever where that's a good thing. Uh, and for what it's worth, the PNG was a shrubbery. So associated with the shrubbery was the second stage implant that would get persistence and provide control over the system in question. So we were able to take leadership within the Department of Energy in doing the analysis on this and then developing follow-on signatures, so Yara, uh, far more uh, in-depth network signatures on the command and control pro protocol, and confirmed the items that Velexity was reporting, so we were able to gain confidence on what threat intel work was put out there already. Let's see, anything else here? Yeah, so there's some goofy run DLL 32s that are being called, you know, calling number two from the DLL. That's also kind of hokey as additionally, you don't see that too often. So a number of things to key on, but we were able to avoid a lot of legwork just given where we put ourselves initially based upon prior work. 
So another case study and sticking more to open source reporting. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the room read this, but Kaspersky put out a report on something they were calling Stone Drill, so Shamoon version three, perhaps, so those who are also not familiar, Shamoon is the malicious wiper worm that really gave Saudi Aramco a bad time back in 2012, I wanna say. Someone can correct me afterwards if I'm wrong on that, but uh, suffice to say, like in this case, the actor, in, the target in question, so we're talking about energy and government interests in the Middle East, outside of my scope, but as we saw with the original Shamoon malware and similar things like Black Energy and Havocs, is that once it's out there and people will know about it, we see the code reused and applied by you know, script kiddies to other actors that are trying to hide their tracks behind someone else's ways of operating. So, even if this is not an immediate threat to us, I want to make sure that we get whatever we can out of this uh, new data set that we've managed to acquire to make sure that we're well positioned when someone does decide to reuse this against us. So the expectation, similar TTPs will emerge by different people and we need to be prepared. So Kaspersky was very nice in this report and they provide a lot of information, but like uh, a certain former president who is now dead said, you know, trust but verify, I want to make sure that one, that this information is accurate. I'm sure their analysts are very good, but everyone makes a, makes a mistake and has a bad day. But not only that, by uh, doing an analysis on our own, we make sure that the information that we pull out and that we're looking for is mapped to what we can identify within our environment. It doesn't help that you find like some great awesome Yara signature for a malware sample and you have no way of actually running a Yara signature against things in your environment. You've done something that's of academic importance but of operational insignificance. So our local analysis confirmed Kaspersky's conclusions. This malware was noisy as hell, which considering it's a malicious piece of software, that's not too surprising. It could be very noisy at some point, but even up to the stage because this one sleeps until it uh, either sets to go off on a timer or is uh, told to fire off, that even in the initial infection steps, it's pretty noisy. So among other things, we had some very interesting uh, command switch C calls, both to WMIC and uh, doing a reg delete, which is also fairly rare, especially when you're talking about doing it against current version run, uh, a very odd ping, and some additional things that we were able to key on. So how do we go about this? We grab some samples from VirusTotal, awesome resource, and thank you to the people that submit their malware to the cloud so that others like me can look at them. Uh, and then really right off the bat, plain text strings. Be amazed what you would find sometimes. Uh, among other things, confirming that you know it does do that command C to WMI to start WScript, which WMI, WScript, calling a VBS item, that's pretty shady. Um, got an executable name, that's good, comes up later on. And then in doing this in runtime, so taking those samples, applying them in a custom sandbox, uh, you know, no knock on FireEye or Wildfire or anything else, but you know, if you're not running it in a sandbox that's attuned to how your own environment looks, you're probably gonna be missing some things, and not only that, but any malware writer that's worth his or her salt knows how to evade those. So in running it through a custom sandbox that's oriented to how our environment looks, we were also able to see like, okay, there's a WMI call, there's this display storage adapter also being called via WMI. So you know, this wasn't even all that much work. This was maybe a couple of hours. Uh, not even getting into firing up Ida Pro and digging in deep on this or starting to you know, grab PCAP that was dorked up and trying to develop custom signatures. Uh, certainly we can, can and are going deeper. This has kind of fallen off the wayside in terms of priorities, but just based upon this initial work, we were able to get a pretty robust set of signatures for this specific intrusion set. Uh, and not only that, but we were able to identify some things that we weren't really looking at all that well that probably we should be. For example, command switch C to WMI calls. Yeah, you'll see that when someone's trying to do, you know, run a script or whatever to try and find like, okay, here's knowledge base article, whatever, or do some system survey information as part of general administration work. But outside of that, typically very rare, and when it does happen, it's not all that good. So reorient ourselves, start tracking that activity so that when it occurs, we're aware of it, and then we can, you know, prosecute it as we see fit. Not only that, but the ping in question. So this was pinging one time to 1.0.0.0. I have never seen that before, but we have seen pings like this before. So ping one time to localhost or two times. Uh, ransomware does this. I've seen some other nation state samples that do this. So okay, encompass this all into some sort of like snarky ping activity monitoring and make sure that when that happens, we see it. Uh, what value did we gain? So insight into an entire class of host execution activity uh, that we weren't previously monitoring, the WMI stuff. Not only that, but identified a gap that we really didn't have a good way of capturing this sort of information when it gets put into a WMI listener. So that's something that we're working on right now. But again, identifying these gaps is critical because I'd rather find it out now as a result of reading about it than find it out later when we're doing an after action to an actual intrusion. 
Um, let's see, some actor vector-specific alerting, which, you know, it's a value in this case if someone decides to just completely repurpose this code because they find it on GitHub or out there on the internet somehow. Okay, we're covered, but uh, more importantly, we just gained a better insight for some things we should be looking for in the network to monitor and where we should go from there. So, let's put all this together now. So, network defense intelligence and hunting should be an iterative reinforcing process. So intel is what's new and emerging, what you haven't seen, and hunting is what is actively targeted, what you can see. It's in your network already, going out and looking for anomalies or other things that uh, should be of greater value. The process must be iterative, because if you do this as a one-off, you know, that's all well and good, but if you're not following the thread on each and every item, which sounds as though it's tedious and takes a lot of time, yes it does, um, you're missing something. So each alert, each false positive has a lesson in forming overall security. So even paying attention to false positives, and I tell our SOC guys like, hey, you see this more than a couple of times, I wanna know about it because it means that we're generating, you know, our signal to noise ratio is going down. I don't like that. I wanna make sure that we're not, you know, playing whack-a-mole on things that don't matter and instead we can orient ourselves to things that do. Uh, and finally, you know, all of this, most of what I've talked about isn't, you know, a lot of technical wizard wizardry. There's some resources that you need to be aware of, but at the end of the day, it's people that are the most important part of it. So appliances and tools are helpful, but if you don't have people that have that real combative, I want to dig in, rip this apart, and figure out how it ticks mindset, you're kind of putting yourself at a disadvantage. So just having, you know, alert closing ticket monkeys is not going to do you all that good in your security operations, but getting people that really like putting the puzzle together and figuring out how the overall picture works is vital to ensure that you, one, have a good security operation, two, that you really are taking the fight to the adversary because you're adopting the same mindset as the pen tester, black hat, however you want to put it. So where do we go from here? So for those of you that are involved in operational security, please bring this back to your security teams if you think there was any value in it. Figure out what works, what doesn't. Share best practices is the other important thing. You know, every time I come up with an idea or someone on my team, I want to make sure that I share it with everyone that we work with within the enterprise, circles of trust, known good relationships with other people in the field, because again, the more that we apply a more rigorous uh, mindset towards pursuing the adversary, whether it's through alerting, hunting, signature development, the more and more that we push them towards, you know, more esoteric ways of operating and limiting their own freedom of movement in terms of how they can come after us from the defender standpoint and our networks. And lastly, it's never be complacent because at the end of the day, you know, it's an ever evolving landscape. As I tell everyone on my team, if you're bored, you're doing something very fundamentally wrong because there's always more information to look at, more stuff out there to go grab, just, you know, other people's minds that you can pick in order to try to identify what it is that we're missing. So with that, I'm open for questions if anyone has or comments, what have you. So I've thought about this. Um, you know, honeypots are certain. Uh, I should probably not wander away from the microphone. So in looking at certain network enclaves, it's something that we've pursued. It's not something that I've gotten much in the way of uh, buy-in from those who authorize our network to actually implement. But I think it's a very worthwhile avenue to go down. For example, say you know you have a DMZ or you know where all of your web applications live. Throw a dummy host up there. Anything ever touches it, probably want to know about it. You know that's really simple stuff and. You know, as long as you're talking about some of the less sophisticated actors, what's one of the first things they're going to do when they get on host is that they want to see what else is out there. Oh, I have a file shared to some other machine that's on here that happens to be that dummy host. Okay, go forth and prosecute. Yes. If I were to create like a, a, a similar kind of environment to the mm -hmm. network, it, you know, just looking for my own, like, I mean, it's just a matter of saying if the network uh, breaches, should they kind of ask me plausible? Yeah, so I mean, there's a number of things to look for. It's like, among other things, like, Give your damn user an actual username instead of calling it user or malware or sandbox, which happens. You know, so there's like really low-hanging fruit that is almost inexplicable why this exists in automated sandboxes. But then up from there, if you really want to get sophisticated, you can create a fake Active Directory, which I've done that before, and that's not pleasant. But once you do it, do it once and do it right, you're done. So that's good. Uh, but getting like you know a fake domain, fake network activity to a web server and you know other services that you can control, uh, so you can start. Um, 
simulating traffic for, you know, oh, I see command and control in this case, okay, revert, put up a dummy file or whatever, how does it try and execute it, you know, just iterating from there, and even things like, you know, all of your instrumentation and monitoring tools. So, okay, most things are gonna be looking for Procmon or, um, you know, uh, auto runs and other things like the sysinternal suite, which are very useful tools, you can just rename all of those and you've automatically evaded a number of different anti-analysis checks right off the bat. And if you're running other stuff, like if you're running Wireshark on your sandbox, it's probably a bad thing anyway because Wireshark has its own problems. Um, but yeah, just one being aware of how it is that malware tries to look for that it's running in a place where it sh doesn't really want to be run and then making sure that that environment that you've set up then mirrors what you're looking at in your own environment so that what information you gleaned from it mirrors what you would see on a vanilla host that you have to go out and defend later. I, did that help or, okay. Anyone else? Hmm. All right. Hmm. Oh, thank you.